mini review. Hi everyone, Anthony Fantano here, the internet's busiest music nerd. And it's time for a review of the new Kamasi Washington record, The Epic. This is a long album, therefore this will be a pretty long review. But before we get into the longer part of this review, I thought for those of you who might just kind of want to cut to the chase, we will do a short mini review before we get to this longer review. Here we go. you go. That's the mini review of this record. Now, if you're looking for something that is a little bit more descriptive, in depth, uh, here we go. Saxophonist, band leader, composer, Kamasi Washington. You might have heard his name in his playing before because he's actually performed on Flying Lotus's latest record, You're Dead, and this new album of his is actually on Flying Lotus's record label, Brain Feeder Records. But Kamasi's musical journey has been running long before that point. He's been a multi-instrumentalist since his teens. Over the years, he has had the opportunity to collaborate with, tour behind some big names in pop, soul, jazz, as well as hip hop. There is one CD from about a decade ago that you could check out. Kamasi is featured in a group named the Young Jazz Giants. He also has a handful of kind of small, obscure, self-released albums. This new record from Kamasi and his band really seems to be his first big step on a label backing his music with some major promotion. While he has been working for years on music, much of that time has been spent backing up and helping other artists. Now he's really giving us a long, hard look at him and, and his creative ideas in the limelight. And the vision is actually pretty fantastic. And on this first big outing, Kamasi has seen fit to give us this album, which is a three hour jazz epic consisting of pretty much three albums within an album, each of which, from what I feel, can be enjoyed outside of the context of the record itself. So don't feel pressure to listen to this whole thing in one sitting. Try to take the time to maybe not listen to the whole thing in one go, but maybe just get to know each album individually. And then from there, if you feel like listening to the whole thing in just a, a marathon, then go for it. Still though, even without the, the looming obligation to listen to this LP from beginning to end, when listening to this album, I was still kind of worried, is there enough diversity and creativity on this record to justify three hours of length? And ultimately to that question, I have to say yes. Between the instrumentation on this LP brings a lot of different flavors. The handful of horns that appear on this record, the percussion, the, the piano, the basses, the electric, and the upright. You might actually hear Thundercat on this record, who you might be familiar with from Flying Lotus's music as well. The vocalists, as well as an entire string section, is employed to create the magic of this album. And a bunch of different jazz styles are brought to the table on this album as well, whether it be some spiritual jazz or bop in its subgenres. You have a bit of jazz fusion on here, fusing jazz with funk. And of course there's vocal jazz on this thing and even a beautifully harmonious and melodic rework of Debussy's Claire de Lune. Over the course of three hours, the epic goes down a lot of emotional and, and musical avenues. So in this review, because we are talking about so much music here, I hope to just kind of talk about each album individually, not going too deep into every single track, just because, I mean, again, it's a lot of music here. Even before the epic begins, Kamasi is making, I think, a lot of presumptions, naming this album the epic, giving this longing, just very deep gaze into the viewer or the, the listener's eyes on this album art, as well as placing himself into space. And on top of all of that, we have the opening track here titled Changing of the Guard. You would think that Together, uh, Kamasi and his band are trying to come out with a game changer here. And when you listen to the opening track of this record, those ambitions are kind of confirmed, for me anyway, because every bit of instrumental arsenal this album has to offer is just locked 
and loaded on this track. The horns, the heavy drums, the bass, as well as the huge group vocals, and the, the massive string sections on this thing. This song is just all cylinders firing at once. There is a very cacophonous and, and very intense piano solo that sort of pops out against some very cool drums and bass on this track. And, and this solo kicks off this song's fantastic gauntlet of improvisational performances. And I love this song's theme, and I think the interplay between just the main jazz instrumentation on this track is fantastic. I guess my one reservation about this song, though, is that it just seems a little bloated or just overwrought at points, especially when the strings don't really seem to be matching the flavor of the instrumentation, when the horns and the drums as well as the pianos are getting really intense, really cacophonous. Meanwhile, the strings are sort of maintaining their very glossy, clean, very composed outward appearance. Instrumentally, the next track on here, Ask Him, actually has a similar size to it in terms of instrumental presence, but I think there's just maybe a bit more grace to how the strings are worked in, and I actually think the strings complement the jazz instrumentation when it's sort of building up to its peak of intensity really nicely, and the uh, song actually smooths out very beautifully after that. And it's by the second track here that I'm actually starting to really love Kamasi's playing style on this record. Sometimes he is pulling out these really flashy, virtuous, dizzying, and, and melodic solos, or he is just blowing in his instrument so hard that it's screeching, it's screaming, and he's just blurting out these, these really hard-hitting intervals that, uh, even, even though they may be simple in a sense, they're really emotionally powerful. All over this LP, Kamasi shows finesse as well as just brutish power on the sax, and it's wonderful. On the following track, Isabel, there's kind of this uh, just very <laughs> sad, teary-eyed, soap opera-esque organ that fits the very laid-back and slow pace of the performance on this track very nicely. It's a milder song in the track listing here, one that didn't really stick out to me quite as much, but I love how musically uh, the song resolves from some very sour and, and, and dissonant melodies and harmonies to some very beautiful and, and harmonious chords, uh, you know, sort of going back and forth throughout the performance between those two flavors. There is the song Final Thought, which hits way harder, really an aggressive standout for the first third of this album, one of my favorites in the track listing here. And the song The Next Step, which is sort of a, I don't know, kind of an inconspicuous track for me at the start. There's a load of moments on this track where we're kind of getting this, this very standard and, and run-of-the-mill walking jazz bass line fitting against uh, some pretty standard jazz instrumentation. But I think this song's sort of trick, this, uh, this ace in its sleeve that it kind of pulls out as it progresses along, is that it turns from this, this very plain sounding jazz instrumentation into these really amazing ascents upward. The instrumentation kind of becomes noisy, scattered, really just fills the mix in this beautiful, gorgeous way. And I feel like I am, I am transported from this, this place where I feel very familiar to the sound, to the tone, to the, the musical world that I'm in, to like being like where Kamasi is right now, just listening. I feel like I'm rocketed off to this intergalactic musical realm. The next step, I feel like the title here actually means something and that I am stepping away from this kind of normal jazz sound to something just a little bit more, I don't know. <laughs> hard to put into words. And the closing track to the first third of this album is a really nice, beautiful piece of vocal jazz with some powerful lyrics, although I will say the singing on this record consistently is a little campy, and, and that's nothing specific to this record or anything like that. There's a lot of very campy vocal jazz out there. It's just kind of a, a style, a delivery that you might have to get used to if you're unfamiliar with vocal jazz. There are plenty of campy metal singers out there, but that doesn't necessarily mean that their music can't be appreciated for what it is. But the campiness is there, it's kind of theatrical, it's a little overacted, but in a sense, this track kind of sounds like the, the closing to a very great first act of some kind of amazing, ambitious jazz stage show. Now, part one gives this LP a great start, but for me, part two of the epic is really where this album sparked for me, really came to life. I feel like on part two, 
Kamasi and The Next Step are a little less focused on big presentations and impressing the listener and, and introducing themselves, and, and now they just really dig in and deliver a, a goddamn great jazz record. This part two of the epic is, to me, a perfect or near-perfect album within a larger album. From the very fast and furious misunderstanding that kicks the second part off, which is just so intense. I love the theme melody of this track, and I am just, just blazed by the pace that Kamasi and his band are able to keep up on this track, which contrasts very nicely with the slower, sweeter melody on the song Leroy and Lanisha, which comes up directly after, feels kind of like something I would hear in a musical. Then the pace picks up, we get a funky bass groove and some tight hand percussion on the song Rerun. And on top of it, the vocals, just the extra instrumentation, complements the intense performances on this second third of this album, specifically on this track really nicely, which I think was a must because this second part of the epic has the most fiery performances of the entire album for me. Seven Prayers was a nice move to put on this second disc because it is one of the most soft and kind of fluid songs throughout the entire LP. It really feels like the horns are, are guiding the rest of the instrumentation on this track. They're working at a very syrupy, fluid tempo while the pianos and the percussion kind of just orbit and, uh, and circle around, dance around these horns in a, in, a, in a really sort of lazy, cluttered way, but it's a beautiful clutter. The song Henrietta, Our Hero, brings more vocal jazz to the table, and I love that with each third here we're getting more lyrics, more singing, just kind of break up the different flavors of each part of this record. And then the closing track here, the... <laughs> oh man. The Magnificent Seven has some of the most intense horn solos on this entire record, to the point when I was first listening to this track, um, got kind of choked up, especially with the rhythm instrumentation playing so intensely behind these solos, really just giving the emotion, the emotional power of the horn playing on this record, just a really strong <laughs> foundation, just lifting up the horn playing in a really aggressive way. And the result is just chemical you know, just chemical chain reaction, just explosions, musical explosions all over this record. Again, you know, just <laughs> got a little choked up listening to this track because it's just so... <clears throat> the saxophone is just screaming on this song. And there's some great big chorus vocals on this track too, as well as a kind of just weird psychedelic-ish bass solo that kind of glides the song out. And some really sharp string embellishments that are kind of playing in the background. Again, another third on this album finishes with an amazing, just very eventful closer. And, and really the epic could have stopped here, but it <laughs> keeps going into our third part where we get the song Rerun Home, which is kind of a revisit to the song Rerun, which has a, a bit of a, I guess, a nuttier percussion section. Some dueling horns as well. I wish the sound of this track, the way that they reapproached it, was just a little bit different in flavor, but I will say that in comparison to the original or the, the first version of Rerun, this version is definitely peppier. It's just that, you know, I, I guess I just wished for just a little bit more of a change, given that this newer take on the song is six minutes longer than the original, which was already eight. And that's the thing about this album. I mean, you're getting long tracks on this thing. You know, if you're if you're not that familiar, if you're not really a big jazz fan, uh, listening to the first disc of this album can be a little unwelcoming at first because you're getting one 12 minute song after another. So whether you're a jazz fan or not, uh, if you are listening to this album and you feel like, you know, you're just getting a little tuckered out listening to this album, sort of pace yourself. Just take a break because there are a lot of beautiful moments on this record that you don't want to miss. So this rerun home track, I mean, really great 70s style funk 
percussion and just backing instrumentation on this song. The rework of Claire de Lune on this last third is wonderful. Another tear jerker moment for me. With Cherokee and with Malcolm's theme, we're getting these vocal jazz tributes to the two figures that are mentioned in the titles to these tracks. We actually get a vocal snippet of Malcolm X talking at the very end of Malcolm's theme. And the closing track, The Message, I mean, you know, maybe not the most explosive track on the entire LP, but is one of the harder songs here, and for better or worse, it closes the album out. I would just say at this point, uh, it's just another fantastic performance in a gauntlet of already fantastic performances. Maybe it doesn't seem quite as special when I'm listening to it in the context of the entire record, but sort of in the context of this last third of this album, I mean, it's certainly great because, again, I, I do feel like these albums can be listened to out of context of the greater record. You don't need to listen to the entire thing in one sitting. So there are a lot of musical highlights all over this LP, but sort of the, the, the grander sort of foundational things of this record, the production is amazing. I mean, all the instrumentation is just recorded very well with the exception of a few moments at the very beginning of this album, I think the strings and the group vocals blend into the jazz instrumentation very nicely. The bass sounds great, the drums sound great, the horns, the vocals, I mean, it's all just very well placed. The time that it must have taken to record as well as mix this three hour album is, uh, it's, 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 it's scary to think of. Then we have the interplay between all the musicians on this record. Just the core jazz instrumentation is great. I mean, that alone, without the extra vocals, without the strings, would make an amazing record. And then we have just the, the solos, which track for track for track are astounding. The music and the writing on these songs, those tracks that do have, you know, composed elements to them, as well as just the intricacy of these songs as well. There's just you know, nothing as far as a foundational characteristic of this record that I'm disappointed with. And, and it's these things, as well as just all the, the, the variety and the diversity among these tracks and just the, you know, the, the wonderful embellishments uh, in each song and improvisations. I mean, it's, it's all these things that are gonna continue to drive me back to this album over the course of this year, because with each listen, I'm just gonna be picking up and just enjoying more things. The one critique, one big critique I could make of this record though, generally, is that, I mean, it's three hours long and not that it is too long, not that, you know, it should have been shorter, but you know, with, a record that delivers three hours of music. Of course, uh, not every moment is as amazing as the next, but um, I give this album <laughs> super duper, like high praise for coming out with this much music and just the vast, 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 vast majority of it being incredibly enjoyable, fun, forward thinking, and creative. And I don't think there's anything else I can say about this amazing three hour album. I'm feeling a light to decent nine on this record. Transition. If you've given this album a listen, what did you freaking think of it? Did you want to pet it? Did you want to euthanize it? And what do you think Anthony should review next? Also, would you like to see Anthony interviewed by a super intelligent talking cat that was zapped by God through the internet? Of course you would. So click my furry freaking face right now, but not directly on my nose because it's a little sensitive. And you'll watch the Creationist Cat Show with your Anthony Fantano. And you'll subscribe to my channel and behold my furry feline glory for all eternity. Creationist Cat, interviewing Anthony Fantano. Subscribe to my channel or you'll totally burn in hell forever.